I'm really happy to have Jory Graham reading for us this evening. It's a treat. And before I introduce her, I just want to let you know about some other upcoming readings. Uh, we, we run the marathon, all of us, next Monday, so we won't be here. That was a joke. <laughs> April, April 22nd, Carl Phillips and Will Scoot will be reading. April 29th, Catherine Barnett and Oni Buchanan. May 6th, Joan Wickersham and Jennifer Haig. Uh, May 13th is Frank Bedart. And then June 3rd, uh, Kay Ryan will be reading at First Parish Church. Are there other readings for this upcoming week that people would like to announce? Okay. I think Jory Graham needs little introduction to most of you. Her many poetry collections include most recently Place, winner of the Ford Prize, as well as Sea Change, Overlord, Never, Swarm, The Errancy, and The Dream of the Unified Field, selected poems from 1974 to 1994, which is winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Her earlier collections include Region of Unlikeliness, The End of Beauty, Erosion, and Hybrids of Plants and Ghosts. She's also edited a couple anthologies. Her many honors include a MacArthur Fellowship and the Morton Dow and Zabel Award from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. This year, she received the 38th Nonino Prize. She's taught for many, she taught for many years at the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop and is currently the Boylston Professor of Rhetoric and Oratory here at Harvard. Joy Graham has also served as the Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets from 1997 to 2003. I'll say very little about her poetry except to say that it is a poetry of query, querying history, language, the self, the body, the other, it's, it looks at seeing. The critic Calvin Bediant has observed that she is never less than a dialogue with everything. In The Bird That Begins It, the speaker asks, what is the job today my being asks of light? Please, tell me my job. It's a question the poet has been asking, an ever-changing task that she's been answering in all her poems. Jory Graham. Visible. I didn't expect that. Um, there's so many uh, fantastic poets in the room that uh, it's a real uh, scary delight to be reading here. Walking over here this evening, the uh, the music um, street musicians were back out in the square, and um, I felt that sort of incredible moment of transition between the two seasons. I'm going to read a poem from Sea Change, titled "Later in Life," um, which is about the the moment that probably will happen in just a few days when you really feel like the the uh, transition from spring to summer has somehow occurred, and it, you cannot go back from it. It, uh, it. Can you see, even see me over this thing? <laughs> like what the top half of my head? Okay, okay. Because like what? I, I can't really. Get, I mean, I could try, but this book is too big. To, um, am I that short? It's incredible. Like who reads here? <laughs> All right, it's okay, it's all right, it's all right, I can handle it, as long as you don't mind the voice sort of coming out of the back of this. Um, <laughs> this is from Sea Change, and it was a poem, one of uh, most of the poems in the book, uh, an attempt to describe for myself, um, as well as on behalf of others, what it would have been like to look back on um, something like a transition between seasons retrospectively from a time in which perhaps those transitions were no longer occurring. Uh, there are some um, moments in it where clearly Williams 
is invoked, but you would have to see the punctuation mark after the word spring to, uh, to know that. <laughs> Later in life, summer heat, the first early morning of it, how it lowers the pitch of the cry, human cast up as two words by the worker, street level, positioning the long beam on the chain as he calls up to the one handling the pulley on the seventh floor. One call. They hear each other perfectly. As the dry heat, as the filled out leaves thicken the surround, the warming asphalt and the lull in growth occurs and in it the single bird cries now and again are placed and all makes a round from which sound is sturdied up without dissipation or dilation, bamboo crisp and up it goes like a thing tossed without warp of weight or evidence of overcome gravity as if space were thinned by summer now to a non-interference. Up it goes, the cry, all the way up, audible and unchanging, so the man need not even raise his voice to be heard. The dry, warm air free to let it pass without loss of any of itself along its way. I step out and suddenly notice this. Summer arrives, has arrived, is arriving. Birds grow less than leaves, although they cheap, dip, arc. A call across the tall fence from an invisible neighbor to his child is heard right down to the secret mood in it the child also hears. One hears in the silence that follows the great desire for approval and love, which summer holds aloft, all damp leached from it, like a thing floating out on a frail but perfect twig end, light seeming to darken in it, yet glow. Please, it says, but not with the eager need of spring. Come what may, says summer. Smack in the middle, I will stand and breathe. The future is a superfluity I do not taste. No, there is no numbering here. It is a gorgeous swelling, no emotion, as in this love is no emotion. No, also no memory. We have it all now, and all there ever was is us now. That man holding the beam by the right end and saying, go on his ground from which the word and the cantilevered metal rise. There is no mistake. The right minute falls harmlessly, intimate, overcrowded, without provenance, perhaps bursting with nostalgia, but ripening so fast without growing at all. And what is the structure of freedom but this? And grace and the politics of time look south, look north, yes, east, west, compile, hope, synthesize, exceed, look, look again, hold fast, attach, speculate, drift, drift, recognize, forget, terrible gush, gash of form, of outwardness, and it is your right to be so entertained. And if you are starting to feel it is hunger, this gorgeousness, feel the heat fluctuate and say, my name is day, of day, in day. I want nothing to come back, not ever. And these words are mine. There is no angel to wrestle. There is no intermediary. There is something I must tell you. You do not need existence. These words, praise be, they can for now be said. That is summer. Hear them. Another poem from Sea Change.
this one's a little bo bit more, um, you know, upset. That was the most positive poem in the book about the situation, but it got kind of, you know, where it's upsetting. We're not paying attention to enough. And at any rate, this since the sun is coming back strong, I thought I'd read Nearing Dawn. Sunbreak. The, the sky opens its magazine. If you look hard, it is a process of falling and squinting, and you are interrupted again and again by change and crouchings out there which you are told each second you... Sorry, I'm going to start this over. Nearing dawn. Sunbreak. The sky opens its magazine. If you look hard, it is a process of falling and squinting, and you are interrupted again and again by change, and crouchings out there where you are told each second you are only visiting, and the secret whitening adds up to no meaning. No, not for you. Wherever the loosening muscle of the night startles open the hundreds of thousands of voice boxes, into which your listening moves like an aging dancer still trying to glide. There is time for everything. Everything is there not, though the balance is difficult, is coming undone, and something strays farther from love than we ever imagined, from the long and orderly sentence which was a life to us, the dry leaves on the fields through which the new shoots glow now also glowing, wet curled tips pointing in any direction, as if the idea of a right one were a terrible forgetting, as one feels upon waking, when the dream is cutting loose, is going back in the other direction, deep inside, behind, no, just back, and one is left looking out, and it is breaking open further. What are you to do? How let it fully in? The wideness of it is staggering. You have to have more arms, eyes, a thing deeper than laughter, furrows more capacious than hate, forgiveness, remembrance, forgetfulness, history, silence, precision, miracle. More furrows are needed. The field cannot be crossed this way. The wide shine coming towards you, standing in the open window now. A dam breaking, reeking rich with the end of winter. Fantastic weight of loam coming into the soul. The door behind you shut. The great sands behind there, the pharaohs, the millennia of carefully prepared and buried bodies, the ceremony and the weeping for them, all back there, lamentations, libations, earth full of bodies everywhere, our bodies, some still full of incense, and the sweet burnt offerings, and the still rising festival outcryings, and we will inherit from it all nothing. And our ships will still go after the ritual killing to make the wind listen out to sea as if they were going to a new place, forgetting they must come home yet again ashamed no matter where they have been, and always the new brides setting forth, and always these ancient veils of theirs falling from the sky all over us, and my arms rising from my sides now as if in dictation, and them opening out from me, and me now smelling the ravens, the blackbirds, the small heat of the rot in this largest cage, bars of light crisping its boundaries, and look, there is no cover. You cannot reach it, ever, nor the scent of last night's rain, nor the chainsaw raised to take the first of the far trees down, nor this creek's tongued surface, nor the minnow turned by the bottom of the current. Here is an outstretched arm. Then here is rightful day and the arm still there, outstretched at the edge of a world. Tyrants imagined by the bearer of the arm, winds listened for, corpses easily placed anywhere the mind wishes, in box, 
outbox, machines that do not tire in the distance, barbed wire taking day sheen on, marking the end of the field, the barbs like a lineup drinking itself crazy, the wire where it is turned round the post standing in for mental distress, the posts as they start down the next field sorting his from mine, his from the others, until you know following following, all the way to the edge and then turning again, then again to the far fields, to the height of the light. You know you have no destiny. No. You have a wild, unstoppable rumor for a soul. You look all the way to the end of your gaze. Why did you marry? Why did you stop to listen? Where are your fingerprints? The mud out there hurrying to the white wood gate its ruts, the ants in it, your imagination of your naked foot placed there, the thoughts that in that there is all you have and that you have no rightful way to live. I read out one um, or two more from Sea Change, and then I'll, I'll move to place. This is another one of those. Um, I'm going to read two more that are written from a, an attempt at at uh, penetrating a kind of uh, what I was ta thinking about at the time as deep futurity. It's a term used a lot by people in, um, in uh, climate science as sort of what they would hope the imagination um, might be capable of opening up as a channel um, which would permit us to imagine a link between our actions at present and people more than ten generations hence, or at least the, I mean the Hopi Indian would refer to them as the seventh generation. But you know we can't even imagine anything past grandchildren or great grandchildren. So the idea of imagining that there's a not a theoretical or conceptual, but a physical, emotive link that you can somehow trace. Um, between your life today and that of someone who would be speaking a language you can't imagine and living in a way that you can't imagine as a project for the imagination interested me. It is obviously deeply related to a capacity for deep past thinking. They mirror each other so that if we narrow our, our experiences to what people call the very presentist uh, ways in which especially our technology is helping us to now live, you know, a, a narrow bandwidth in which things like um, collapse of, of uh, empathy, attention deficit, and um, very shortened attention spans in all ways um, come into being, especially in our children, the, the, the possibility of uh, opening up channels of, of literal imaginative deep futurity. Um, seem truly more difficult than they did even when I was writing this book. So I'm just going to read two more poems from this this particular um, frame of mind or exercises of the imagination. This one is titled Futures. It remembers, um, tries to remember uh, owning, the sensation of owning, which got really interesting to me. Like, what was it like to have money? You know, I meant that metaphorically, obviously. I will never retire. It's hopeless. OK. Um, just trying to make some small talk between these things. You know what I mean? OK, this one's called <laughs> Futures. I don't know what. I can't see you. I don't know what to talk to you about. Um, there's nothing I can tell you about the poems, because they just do whatever they're going to do anyway. I can't rewrite them now. Uh -huh. Futures. 
midwinter, dead of. I own you, says my mind. Own what? Own whom? I look up. Own the looking at us, say the cuttlefish branchings, lichen black, moist. Also the seeing, which wants to feel more than it sees. Also in the glance, the feeling of owning, accordioning out and up, sea fanning. And there is cloud on blue ground up there, and wind which the eye loves so deeply it would spill itself out and liquefy to pay for it. And the push of owning is thrilling, is spring before it is, is that swelling, is the imagined fragrance as one bends before the thing is close enough, wide-eyed, leaning, although none of this can make you happy. Because looking up, the sky makes you hear it. You know why we have come, it blues. You know the trouble at the heart, blue, blue. What pandemonium, blur of spears, roots, cries, leaves, master and slave, the crop destroyed, water everywhere not drinkable, and radioactive waste in it, and bodily human waste. And what, says the eye thinking heart, is the last color seen, the last word heard, someone left behind, then no behind. Is there a skin of the I own which can be scoured from inside the glance? No, cannot. And always someone walking by whistling a little tune. That's life, he says, smiling there. That was life. And the heart branches with its wild arteries. I own myself. I own my leaving the falcon watching from the tree. I shall torch the crop that no one else have it, whispers the air. And someone's swinging from a rope, his rope, the eye throbbing, day a noose looking for a neck, the fire spidery but fast. And the idea of friends, what was that? And the day in winter your lower back started acting up again and they pluck out the eyes at the end for food. And don't forget the meeting at six, your child's teacher wishes to speak to you about his future. And if there is no food and the rain is everywhere switching on as expected, and you try to think of music and the blue of Giotto, and if they have to eat the arms, he will feel no pain at least. And there is a sequence in which feeding takes place. The body is owned by the hungry. One is waiting one's turn. One wants to wait. One wants to own one's turn. And standing there, don't do it now, but you might remember kisses. How you kissed his arm in the sun and tasted the sun. And this is your address now, your home address. And the strings are cut no one looks up any longer or out no and one day a swan appeared out of nowhere on the drying river it was sick but it floated and the eye felt the pain of rising to take it in i own you said the old feeling i want to begin counting again I will count what is mine. It is moving quickly now. I will begin this message, I. I feel the smile, put my hand up to be sure. Yes on my lips, the yes. I touch it again. I begin counting. I say one to the swan, one. Do not be angry with me, oh my God. I have begun the action of beauty again. On the burning river, I have started the catalog, your world. I, your speck, tremble, remembering money. It's dry touch, sweet, strange smell. It's a long time. The smell of it like lily of the valley sometimes, and pond water, and how 
one could bend down close to it and drink. I'm going to read a poem from this book that I've never read. No Long Way Round. It goes by rather fast. There is a mention of the 15,000 years of the interglacial low, which is the period that's coming to an end that uh, pretty much um, the civilization that, you know, that, we, that we know of has uh, been able to exist in because of uh, a pretty predominant uh, warming with some cooling periods in it which this book doesn't go into. It's interesting that the Dark Ages were a, a mini glaciation and that um, about the time when St. Francis and Giotto start up, it's a warming period. Can't you just feel the warming? And I always look at Giotto's blues and I think that's a, that's a warming there. But when they talk about those glaciations, they are talking about year-on round ice, um, you know, from Northern Europe down to Portugal so that all those paintings, the northern paintings that we see where there are frozen rivers, I mean, it's interesting to look at those paintings sometimes and try to figure out, you know, what the, what the climate situations were in those periods and what they gave rise to in terms of uh, literature, and religious beliefs, and other such things. This poem um, mentions it, that so quickly in passing. It's not central to it, but it would be awkward to not, to not have noticed it. No long way round. Evening. I should say that each of these uh, felt to me like expanded um, haiku, so that little, the way in which they begin are sort of classic openings from haiku, not quoted from haiku, but just the way that haikus begin, and they are kind of dilated, exploded haikus in my sense of the way a haiku operates, but no long way round. Evening, not quite, high winds again. I have time, my time, as you also do. There, feel it. And a heart, my heart, as you do, remember it. Also am sure of some things, there are errands, this was a voyage. One has an ordained part to play. This will turn out to be not true, but is operative here for me this evening as the dusk settles. One has to believe, furthermore, in the voyage of others. The dark gathers. It is advancing, but there is no progress. It is advancing with its belly full of minutes. It seems to chew as it darkens. There was, in such a time, in addition, an obligation to what we called telling the truth. We liked the feeling of it, truth, whatever we meant by it. I can still feel it in my gaze tonight, long after it is gone, that finding of all the fine discriminations, the edges, purse holding the goods, Snap shut, there, you got it, there, it is yours, it is true. Hold on to it as light thins, holding the lavender in its heart, firm, slow, beginning to hide it, to steal it, to pretend it never had existence. At the window, I stand spellbound. Your Excellency, the evening, I begin. What is this trickiness? I am passing through your checkpoint to a nation that is disappearing, is disappearance. My high ceilinged room, look up, is only going to survive invisibility for the while longer we have the means to keep it. 
I look at the pools of light in it, the carpet shining up its weave, burgundy, gold, aqua, black. It is an emergency, actually, this waking and doing and cleaning up afterwards and then sleep again and then up you go, the whole 15,000 years of the interglacial period and the orders and the getting done and this getting back in time and the turning it back on. And did you remember? Did you pass? Did you lose the address again? Didn't the machine spit it up? Did you follow the machine? Yes. Yes, it did, and the wall behind it pronounced the large bush, then took it back. I can almost summon it, like changing a tense. I peer back through this time to that one. You will not believe it when the time comes. Also, how we mourned our dead, had ample earth, took time, opened it, closed it, our earth. Our dead, we called them, and lived bereavement and had strict understandings of defeat and victory. Evening, what are the betrayals that are left and whose? I ask now as the sensation of what is coming places its shoulders on the whole horizon. I see it though it is headless, intent, fuzzy, possible outcomes unimaginable. You have your imagination, says the evening. It is all you have left, but its neck is open. The throat is cut. You have not forgotten how to sing or to want to sing. It is strange, but you still need to tell your story, how you met the coat one wore, the shadow of which wore, and how it lifted, and how peace began again for that part of the planet and the first spring after your war, and how life began again, what normal was. Thousands of times you want to say this, normal, holding another's hand, and the poplars when you saw how much they had grown while you were away, the height of them, and the paper lantern you were given to hold, the lightness of it, of its fire, how it lit the room. It was your room. You were alone in it and free to sleep without worry and to dream. Winter outside and the embroidered tablecloth, fruit and water. You didn't even wonder where was the tree that gave such fruit. You lay in blankets as if they were non-existent. Heat was a given. The rain coming down hard now, what a nice sound. You could ruminate. The mind traveled back in those days, at ease. It recalled the evening's conversation, the light that fell on X's face, how he turned when a certain person entered the room. You saw him turn, saw shyness, then jealousy, enter his eyes as he looked away. And did he see you see him? And the embroidered linen handkerchief you saw a frightened woman in the subway slide from her pocket, use and replace. Then sleep was near. Somewhere you were a child, and then this now. Nightfall and ease, hospitality. There are sounds the planet will always make, even if there is no one to hear them. And um, I'll read three poems from Place. In this first one, uh, most of the poems in Place um, occur on a day which is the anniversary of some date in the past, but the um, um, uh, the, uh, the day before that anniversary, so that there's a way in which the particular day is fraught with both, both its deep uh, past um, 
life and it's uh, about to be renewed, um, turning in the cycle of time. In this case, this first poem takes place um, on June 5th um, on Omaha Beach, obviously the landing beach for um, Operation Overlord um, on D-Day on June 6th. Um, 1946, but um, this takes place uh, when it's no longer called Omaha, it's now called saint laurent sur mer which is one of the three towns that make up the beach known as Omaha, and it takes place on June 5th, 2009. It is also because of the one of the creatures that appears in this poem, um, it's also the um, beach on which, from which William the Conqueror left almost a thousand years before in um, um, so-called uh, invasion in 1066 of, uh, of uh, Britain. It's interesting to me that uh, obviously William became king and many of his descendants not only ended up living in the uh, United Kingdom, many emigrated to America, uh, for example, in, uh, something that in this town would resonate. Uh, there's a, a castle called Conchi right near Omaha Beach. It's the only source for a family named the Chaunceys that went over with William. And uh, they, some went to the United States, some came obviously here, some went, remained in the United Kingdom, and many of their descendants crossed back over during D-Day. So there is this kind of cycle on that beach of that particular DNA. This, uh, so William was famous for um, many things, including his horse. Uh, so uh, not only Yeats appears as a ghost in this poem, but Yeats did live with Maud Gone on part of Omaha Beach um, uh, before the First World War, briefly. Um, during parts of it, she had a house, and uh, what was interesting to me is apparently he read her first drafts of poems walking on the beach, and. Uh, it's kind of bizarre to walk along Omaha Beach and think of Yeats reading these poems to Maud Gone, including he read her. Um, this was in 19, um, uh, just after 1916, and he did read her apparently one of the early drafts of Easter 1916, which she detested. Um, but to be on Omaha and have to sort of do all these things at once is part of what makes uh, this the, this poem attempt to do so many things at once. But it tries to do them more with an. Uh, degrees of the interaction between the human and the natural world. One of the other things I would say about this poem, it's the first poem in this book. This book is an attempt to figure out how to praise again um, after the poems of the, that I've been reading. And um, I uh, took me a long while to figure out after I'd written it why um, uh, in this poem and in, in many poems of the book, the eyes are closed and uh, are closed at a certain moment. And um, I'm not going to spoil the poem by talking about what I think I figured out about that. Um, I, of course, pretend like I knew it all along, but I had to actually a act it out when I was recording it for Christina to figure out why did I close my eyes in the poem. And um, I, well, it has to do with uh, eliminating the sensation of the horizon, but still feeling that one is moving forward, but without the tug of forwardness that I was describing in the last poems, without the feeling that one is driven by what is in front of one, but rather that one is pushed as much by what is um, alongside one as well as what is behind one. So those positions of forward, alongside, and behind are very are coordinates for this poem, Sundown. Sometimes the day light winces behind you, and it is a great treasure. In this case today, a man on a horse in calm, full gallop on Omaha over my left shoulder, coming on fast but calm, not audible to me at all until I turned back my head for no reason, as if what lies behind one had whispered, what can I do for you today? And I had just turned to answer, and the answer to my answer flooded from the front with the late sun he, they, were driving into, gleaming, 
wet chest and upraised knees and light-struck hooves and thrust out even breathing of the great beast from just behind me, passing me, the rider looking straight ahead and yet smiling without looking at me as I smiled as we both smiled for the young animal, my feet in the breaking wave edge, his hooves returning as they begin to pass by to the edge of the furling break, each tossed up flake of ocean offered into the reddish luminosity, sparks as they made their way, boring through to clear out life, a place where no one again is suddenly killed, regardless of the cause, no one, just this galloping forward with force through the low waves, seagulls scattering all round, their screeching and meowing, rising like more bits of red foam, the horse's hooves now suddenly louder as it goes by and its prints on wet sand deep and immediately filled by thousands of sand fleas thrilled to the declivities in succession in the newly released beach just at the right moment for some microscopic life to rise up through these cups in the hard upslant retreating ocean is revealing sand fleas finding them just as light does carving them out with shadow and glow on each ridge and water oozing up through the innermost cut of the hoof steps and when I shut my eyes now, I am not like a blind person walking towards the lowering sun, the water loud at my right, but like a seeing person with her eyes shut, putting her feet down one at a time on the earth. Um, this is a poem about my very first, uh, it takes place during my very first memory. Um, I know it's theoretically too young to have this memory, but I have it, or many psychotherapists will attest to it. This is my first memory. It takes place in Kanya Somer, a hilltop town in southern France, a uh, Roman town with uh, Roman archways, steep wood, the stone streets. Um, I think of it as a poem um, involved with um, there are many poems in the book in which things swoop down um, hunting uh, hawks um, um, uh, uh, that activity is, is important in ways that I just can't go into this with this much Brevity, but in this case, I think of the poem swooping down to introduce the first person in a particular way. So I think of it of the poem as a way in which um, the invention of what the first person is for me uh, is taking place. Kanye Sermon, 1950. It is the year of my birth, and it's the only poem I've ever written with my mother in it, which makes her immeasurably happy. <laughs> and thank God she doesn't understand the poem. <laughs> Go figure, just that she's in it is enough, I guess. It's amazing. <laughs> I am the only one who ever lived who remembers my mother's voice in the particular shadow cast by the sky-filled Roman archway which darkens the stones on the down-sloping street up which she now has come again suddenly. How the archway and the voice and the shadow sees the small triangle of my soul violently, as in a silent film where the accompaniment becomes a mad body for the spirit's skipping images, abandoned homeland, miracle from which we come back out alive. So here, from there, again, I read it off the book of time, 
my only time, as if in there is a fatal mistake of which I cannot find the nature or shape or origin. I pick up the infant and place it back again to where I am a small reservoir of blood, 12 pounds of bone and sinew and other matters already condemned to this one soul, which we are told weighs less than a feather or as much as four ounces when grown. As if I could travel, I back up those arteries, up the precious liquid, across the field of methods, agonies, astonishments. May I not squander the astonishments. May I not mistakenly kill brother, sister. I will sit once again so boldly at my beginning, dark spot where one story does not yet become another and words which have not yet come to me will not yet try to tell where each thing emerges, where it is heading, and where the flow of tendency will shine on its fast way downhill. And it will seem to me that all this is legend, one of those in which there is no way to look back, and yet you do, you pay for it, yes, but you do. It was a hilltop town in the South in summer. It was before I knew about knowing. My mind ran everywhere and was completely still at the center. And that did not feel uncomfortable. A bird sang. It added itself to the shadow under the archway. I think from this distance, that I was happy. I think from this distance. I sat. It was before I knew walking. Only my soul walked everywhere without weight. Where the road sloped downhill, there was disappearance, which was exactly what I imagined should happen. Appearance and disappearance in my only life. When my mother's voice got closer, it had a body. It had arms and they were holding something that must have been a basket. My mind now can go round her, come in front and wrap her as her arms wrapped that basket. And it must have been wicker because I can see the light, the many lucent browns, the white tips as she steps out of the shadow in which nothing but her hands and the front of her act of carrying are visible. And when her body arrives, it is with the many lemons entirely struck, entirely taken by sunshine, which the heavy basket is still now carrying, and her bright fingernails woven into each other, and her face with its gaze searching for me gaze which felt like one of the bright things she was carrying in front of herself, a new belly. All I was to invent in this life is there in the wicker basket among the lepins. Having come up from below the horizon where the sound of the market rises, up into the private air in which she is moving, where she is still a whole woman and a willing woman. And I hear what must be prices and names called out of flowers and fruit and meat and live animals in small cages, all from below us at the bottom of the village, from that part which is so comfortable to me, which is invisible, and in which everything has to be sold by noon. I think that was the moment of my being given my name where I first heard the voices carrying the prices. As her face broke and its smile appeared bending down towards me, saying, there you are, there you are. I'm going to end on a poem that will take another five or six minutes to read. I hope that's okay.
Message from Armagh Cathedral, 2011. Armagh is in Northern Ireland. It's one of the, um, even now, one of the places in which violence is erupting again. It's an impossible um, confrontation zone between the two sides of the Irish conflict. I was there and I was staying in a hotel. How will it be told, this evidence, our life, all the clues missing? The clock I left in my hotel room, all time landing on it at once, has no way to move forward, so round and round it goes, making its ball, its invisible thread, pulling through everything, tensile, on which the whole story depends. But what if it has no direction? We, whoever we were, made that up. Everything that caught our eye shining, we took. Because it exhibited unexpected movement, Quicksilver, we took it by spear. Because it whistled through air, barely dropping its aim from the sniper, we took it to heart. Because it lowered its head in shyness where sun touched it and it put one hand into its other and sang to itself, thinking itself alone, we took it to love, obsessed, heavy with jealousy. Maybe we killed it to keep it, but yes, it was love. Or we looked up and thought, do we hear clearly? And thought, yes, and went back to work. So then, why are you here today on this church floor in Arma, piece of stone, large as an infant, hundreds of pounds, triangular body which ends at waist, swaddled by carvings, 3,000 years old, worked through by chisel and wind and porous where granite has lost all surface. I crouch down and put my own pale arms round you. No one sees me. No one on planet Earth sees us. You say, who are you to me? I see around you the animals run into the woods for cover, away from the priest arriving, the sanctuary around you tall, the shadows long, movement in it, yes, human movement rare, you must have sat in a high place, I say, here on the floor in this back corner where you are discarded. What have you seen, I say under my breath, that I might have seen? I have seen what is under your breath, you reply. I press you to me as I did my child, keeping my hand on the top of your head, your face on my chest, Rainbow, you say, blood, wind, sky blue, though maybe not the same as yours now, no. There is a wedding rehearsal in the body of the church, laughter and constant rehearsal of vows. Will you take her? I listen for the yes. Will you take him, the family's chattering, casual dress, no one in tears as these are not the real vows yet. Tomorrow they will be cast in stone. Tomorrow they will vow to love for all eternity, or that part of it they inhabit called as long as you shall live, adding their sliver of time onto the back of the beast turning under us and the little girls coming round for hide and seek, the men discussing politics, the women in the hum of long time and short time, no one to stop the minutes, their current cannot be staunched, soon it will be fall again, the dress, she says, will have an old-fashioned cut. I wish her luck when our paths cross about an hour from now. I mean what I say to the stranger. 
She sees me mean it, on the threshold, each headed for our car. But you, here on the floor, found in a garden in Tandragi, carved by someone with strong hands in the Bronze Age, you are the ancient Irish king Nwadwa, ruler of the Tuatha de Danan, your people, for whom you lost your left arm, those you defeated moving on elsewhere, westward, while you were forced to stand down as king, not being completely whole in body without arm. And no good king succeeded you. And after great hardship, your people prayed your physician, Dion Kecht, build a new arm out of silver that you be able to take up kingship again. Here you are holding the left arm at the shoulder with your right. Here you are whole again, almost. I bring my hand down onto that spot. Three hands, same size, where I clasp yours, where I cover it, where I hold your arm on with you. At this moment, on this earth, mostly in desert, Many arms are not recovered after the device goes off and the limbs sever. Field hospitals hold young men screaming, where are my legs? Elsewhere, leaders are making decisions. They are thinking about something else while they make them. And names are called out by a surgeon. An aide enters a room when called. A mother opens a door when called. A child opens a gift when told, OK, now, go ahead. A sentence is being pronounced. You shall, you shall lose your hands. You shall lose your feet. You might be a country. You might be a young man who touched the face of a girl in a village thinking yourself alone. You are not alone. The spies survive. The spies are intact. They slaughter the whole animal for sacrifice, all of it at once. The sentence is truncated even if the man is told, do you have anything to say before we begin? They do not wait for him to finish. His mouth hangs open over his swinging body. His lifespan is missing a part, the future. His dream, his dream is missing a part, the rest. He is missing his extremity. Look, look, a button is missing on your long garment, Lord. Look. The jug of water has been brought to wash off the gaping place which is the redrawn border to your nation. I put my arms around you. You are the size of my child at six months. I put my hand in your wide carved mouth. Your maker made you speaking or pronouncing a law or crying out. I can put my fingers into your stone mouth up to my palm. Suckle, speak, cry. Promise, I will keep my fingers between your strong, cold lips. You shall not be alone. When I move up your cheeks, I feel the, bul the bulge of your granite eyes. Wide brow, your eyes again, both hands with fingers rounding eyes. How shall we be whole? Who will make the missing part? This, the biggest obstacle is not knowing of what. Once I saw a wall with its executions still in it. The bullet holes with my fingers in them were just this eye's size. Once I met you, you lowered your other arm and said, why are you taking me this way? I said, I am just on the road. We do not have another way to go. Where does the road go? Tell me, you said. I said, hold on your arm. I can't see a thing without its shine. This isn't a road. I saw bodies and statues, but did not tell you. You were the thing I was here to get, to get to the place where the next king would take us. The last thing that dies, the last thing that dies is the body. I am feeling inside your mouth. She is trying to say the vow again, till death do us part. And I cannot make out what it is that time will do to them. Why are we going this way? The flower girls are carrying a pretend train now. Laughter as they go by. The ring bearer is carrying the pillow with no ring. In late morning, a short time before the explosive device hidden in the basket of fresh laundry went off, Private Jackson, who still had arms then, reached down in secret, 
weapon in one hand to feel the clean fabric, actually to smell it. Clean, he thought. He used to hang it out for his mom afternoons, hands up at the shoulders of each shirt, an extra clip in his teeth as if surrendering. He remembers the lineup of shirt sleeves all blowing one way in the early evening in Indiana, and for a blinding moment he realizes they had been pointing, his brothers, his fathers, his uncle, they had all been pointing in their blues and whites and checks. He wishes he had turned to see, is what he thinks just before it goes off. They seemed about to start a dance, the tiny rhythm in the flapping sleeves. They did not seem like strangers. Then he realized it is, it is here now, that sound, his feet all running on dirt as fast as possible away from this place. The bride steps out into the sun. I feel there is something I must tell her. May your wishes come true, I say, guidebook in hand. Tomorrow, she says, I can't wait until tomorrow.